All righty. Good morning, friends. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jenna. And my name's Steve. And thank you so much for joining us for another Field Trip Friday. Today, we're going to be exploring machine learning and artificial intelligence with Dr. Chris Hazard from Dive Plane. Hi, Chris. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, my pleasure. Each Friday, we're hosted by a different DPS classroom, and I hope one day your classroom can be a host. Today, we are hosted by George Watts Montessori Elementary, um, who isn't joining us quite yet, but I think some people might be in the Zoom chat. So thank you, George Watts, for joining us. And also, we have two folks from Spring Valley Elementary, Miss Williams and Miss Jeffrey's fourth grade class. Woohoo! Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us this morning, everyone. Uh, just letting you all know, if you have any questions while we are watching the video, make sure you can put those in the chat and also any observations you have, put those in the chat. I'll be moderate, moderating the chat um, today and be sure to stick around so we can, for, we can ask Dr. Hazard uh, all of our questions live for the Q&A. What do you think, Steve? Are you ready to watch the video? Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you, Jenna. Um, we'll get started now. Let me get my... Share and set up here. Looking good. All righty. I'm Jenna. And I'm Steve. And welcome to another Field Trip Friday. What are we doing today, Steve? Well, today we're going to the museum where we're going to meet Dr. Chris Hazard, who's going to help us learn a little bit about machine learning and artificial intelligence. That sounds really cool. I don't know a lot about those things, so I'm excited to learn. Yeah, me too. Let's do it. Cool. Hey, Chris. Hey, Jenna. How's hey, it going? How are you? I'm doing okay. Yeah, doing well. So can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what the work Dive Plane does. Sure, yeah, I'm Dr. Chris Hazard. Um, I work with artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we at Dive Plane work on understandable machine learning and AI so that you understand why it did what it did. And we solve a lot of hard problems. And we basically, uh, you know, Steve and I were talking before, we make scientists in a box. That's one way to think about it. Yeah, such a cool idea, yeah. It's, 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 you know, like we work as scientists, of course, in the world, but what if you could make that a automated process? What if you could make little robots that work as scientists? That's that's a super cool concept. Right. And potentially really powerful, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, we, you, you have a laboratory and you brought it with you, is that right? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. <laughs> so here's my laboratory. I can take it with me very easily. Being a computer scientist of various forms allows you to, you know, work remotely or, or work wherever you want, wherever your work takes you. Um, and, you know, sometimes we need a lot of heavy computing, so we'll, you know, connect to, through the internet to work with very large computers and data centers, but sometimes the work that I need to do is can run on this little thing right here. That's so cool. Yeah. That is really cool. So AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. So how are those things different? How do they relate to each other? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a big overlap between the terms. There's artificial intelligence, which means doing something smart, having a machine do something intelligent. It could be making a believable character in a video game, making a you know, difficult bad guy that is, makes challenging moves. It could be routing your, uh, you know, routing the traffic for an airline company. It could be you know, any sort of behavior that is intelligent. Now, machine learning is a piece of that and it's related. It is, uh, normally with, with, with programs when you want to make something intelligent, you have to put in all the logic. If this happens, then do this. You know, for these, do, do these different things. Well, sometimes you just want to teach it with data. You don't want to say, here's the exact instructions to follow. You want to say, hey, watch me do this four times and then do it yourself. And machine learning is about having a, uh, showing a computer to do something with data. Very awesome. Cool. Yeah, and so, so I think um, there, y'all have uh, an example of this might be um, 
there, you, you showed us a uh, drone simulation, and so you were kind of teaching an, an, an intelligence to, to, to use the controls uh, that, that a pilot might use for, for piloting a simulated drone, is that right? Yeah, yeah, if you ever uh, played with uh, drones, you know, sometimes they're, they're very finicky to control. You fly it and it, oh, I almost crashed it, sorry. You know, but <laughs> it, and your friend will never let you touch their, their drone again. Yeah. But, uh, so, uh, Teaching a drone to fly indoor, outdoor, navigating around obstacles, and say, "Well, I want it to move here, then here, then here," and give it that information. Uh, you know, how do you teach it to fly on its own and, and navigate it and perform the types of uh, maneuvers that you'd like it to do? So, one of the things that, that we built at Diaplane in our very early days was being able to teach a drone to fly, teach the build a model that can learn to fly a drone, navigating waypoint to waypoint and um, you know, perform those maneuvers as, as based on your training. And also, if you make a mistake, you can, uh, or, or let's say the AI makes a mistake, you can say, whoa, that wasn't right, take it back and correct it. Right, like if it were to, I, I think you showed me it was like flying into the stairs because that's where the next point was, it was through the stairs. Right. But it didn't realize yet that it couldn't just fly through the stairs. It had to learn not to do that. Right, and it, it bounced in, and that's why we ran in the simulator first before the real world. Right. And then we teach it to fly around. But let's say we teach it to fly around the stairs. We have to measure, did it learn to fly around those stairs specifically, or did it learn how to fly around stairs in general? And that's one of the, the challenging aspects of machine learning is making sure it generalizes in the way that you want it to, to all different types of domains. Right, like when I, when I approach a, a stairwell, I can kind of, even if it has carpet, or even if it's a metal stairwell, or even if it's concrete steps, I still know how to kind of like approach that with my feet. But when I was a child, I'm sure I fell down. In fact, I remember falling down like carpeted stairs because they were slippery or whatever on my socks and things. And I had to learn, like, oh, I need to be careful with this particular step style if I'm going to step down them without falling down. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just like machines, uh, or just like, like us, machines can make mistakes in weird ways. Like if you see an optic, optical illusion and you say, oh, well, that's real stairs. Oh, no, that's not stairs. If you've seen something clever like that, machines can be fooled in similar but different ways. You can have a pattern that looks nothing like stairs, but to the way that the machine was trained, it might look like stairs to mm -hmm. it. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. So um, I think we have an example that we developed um, kind of to try and pull apart some of these ideas with an animal care example of kind of feeding some of the animals in the farmyard and especially lightning. Uh, maybe let's break down some of those problems. How would you even approach this concept. Yeah. So data scientists like to think about this in terms of what we call features. Now features are things that you can measure or reason about. They're different variables that you can measure, variables that you can control or outcomes. You know, we'll sometimes we'll call those targets when we're trying to predict something. So you got to figure out what are we really looking at? Um, you mentioned behavior. So that might, that's definitely one of them. Behavior could be some sort of a feature, but what all entails, what all goes into behavior? Is it, you know, does he lay down? Does he stand up? Is he energetic? What, tell me about what sort of behavior things you usually measure. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think um, in terms of behavior, we can we can look at yeah, how active he is. We mm -hmm. can look at whether he's laying down a lot. We can look at the postures that he's in. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. so I guess when we talk about, I, I've, heard, I've heard that word variable, uh, I mean, as, as a scientist, I've, I've used that a lot, and, and I guess for our audience, I just want to make sure you all know that's basically just something we can measure. It's something that we can we can write down. And so like Chris has here, he's written down the types of behaviors. These are the things that we could say. Is he active? Uh, what posture is he in? We could define a set of postures. So now the other thing we want to measure is the, 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 the variable we want to experiment on, which is the food, right? So we have things that we feed him. Is there some sort of a schedule? Um, is there a new food we're introducing? So these are the sort of things that we would want to enumerate and transform them into features that we can also measure. Now as a scientist, you might say, well, okay, what are the types of food that, that Lightning eats? And you mentioned there's browse, which is a collection of whatever's available. There is, um, uh, there, there's chow, there's hay, there's, there's uh, carrots, etc. And we as people, we know exactly what those are. But we might not want to teach the computer what those are because it's not, it's outside of the purposes of this experiment and the, the data we would like to collect. Right. So one way we can, we can communicate with the computer with, about these concepts is we can enumerate them or encode them. So let's say that we have, um, you mentioned uh, there's, there's hay and, and what was the other one? Uh, donkey chow. Chow. Hay and chow are his like primary foods. He, he eats those every single day. So we have chow and hay, and maybe those are those are um, you know one and two. So we say chow is one, hay is two, and what, what are some other foods? Uh, yeah, go ahead, General. Browse. Yep. Browse. Browse. 
And then there was the special food. Sweet, sweet potatoes. Yep. Yep. Carrots, carrots and sweet potatoes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And those fried potatoes. Okay, so great. So now we can communicate to the, to the machine with number one, number two, number three, number four. And then when we, the machine tells us something, it makes a prediction, it might say, you know, you should feed him more of number four now, or more carrots to, to incentivize him. And then we can decode it back into carrots without having to teach the machine what carrots are. Right. Cool. So now that we've broken down our problem into this kind of concept of variables that, we, that, are, that are things that we can measure, and we're, we're going to get all this data, what are some of the other things that you would, you would coach us on to, to consider in our, in our kind of problem set up here? So to answer this question, sometimes we'll transform the data in ways. Sometimes we'll call it uh, transforming into what's known as a stationary process. Think about stationary where you're standing in one place. You're not moving. You're not going through time. You're just saying, what's around me? And that's a way we can simplify the data for the machine learning algorithm so that it can learn it better, just like we talked about before, simplifying and learning one thing at a time. Right. And uh, in this case, we might say, well, let's look at what we'll call the time lag. So if he eats apples, or eats, eats a lot of apples, how long does it take for that weight to show up? Is it immediate? Is it a little bit longer? And how, what's the time lag with the behavior? If you feed him apples, is he really excited going after the apples? Or is it he's energetic afterward? How, you know, and what are, how do those interplay with, with one another? And by looking at the data and looking at it across time, we can, uh, you know, we can assess both the correlations, you know, when things are related, but also what might cause one another. Right, and so I think you, you showed us an example uh, of, that kind of relates to this concept with uh, Super Mario Brothers. Yeah, so taking a look at this, this uh, Mario Brothers video, you can see that this is an artificial intelligence algorithm that is planning the path for Mario to jump and avoid obstacles. And you see the red line there, that is showing where the, the AI is planned. Now this is a technique called Monte Carlo tree search, big complicated term, but it's a pretty simple algorithm that is searching the path. What is the best way for Mario to reach the end? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you can use machine learning with this, you can use uh, artificial intelligence, and there, there's a you know, sort of oftentimes a mixture of techniques for these types of problems. Ah, oh, that's cool. And, uh, and so it, it makes, a lot of sense, right? Like, I mean, I'm essentially playing that game. When I when I do that, I'm trying to optimize my path through that, and, and so to to automate that again, coming back to this, like we're kind of making little robot scientists, like little robots that are doing that work, the work of a game player, for example. That's that's really cool, and it's also becoming super apparent to me that there's there's a lot, there's so many questions that we can look at. There's so many pieces that we can break down. There was another piece that you had mentioned to this to this. Um, that's important for us to consider. Yes, there's, there's exploration versus exploitation, ah, as we call it. So as you see, you know, when, when Mario is, is trying to evade things, the system might have knowledge that, oh, this is a, you know, this is a pipe, I can go down the pipe. Um, and I know that, this is something I can do. We call that exploiting the knowledge. Mm -hmm. a, again, terms that are pretty common in artificial intelligence. But if I see a new obstacle that I've never seen before, you know, maybe it's a set of st ascending stairs, or maybe it's a platform that falls, I have to explore it. I have to land on it and see what happens. Right. right. And so for that kind of exploration, for the like exploring the space, that's where we start to kind of collect the information, right? That's where we start to collect the data. And I think I remember you telling me earlier about um, we, we were discussing this kind of example of connecting the dots in, in this yeah. concept where we start to build patterns. Do you, do you think we, we could talk a little bit about, about sure. that? Sure. So fundamentally, machine learning sounds like this very complex topic. And it's complex, but fundamentally, it boils down to one thing, and that's connecting the dots. Right. It is, uh, you know, we, we have this data, and what patterns emerge from it? How do we, how do we draw that? So yeah, so if you have a, a few dots, and I'm sure we've all seen or played connect the dots before, and they're numbered, and we want to draw a line that connects them, we just draw the line. Um, but let's say we've got four number ones, and they might be scattered about a little bit. We have uh, some number twos, some number threes. How do you connect a, a line across those different groups of data? And what is the best line that accurately describes, the, or most accurately describes the data? And that's what machine learning is all about, is fitting those lines. Mm. So, Chris, we've talked a lot about a thing, a lot of things kind of like in the abstract stuff. So back to our lightning issue, how can we kind of extrapolate or understand data from all of what we talked about with lightning? Like we were talking about ones and twos and threes and dots. How do all these relate to the things that we talked about with lightning's diet? 
Yeah, so we'll look at his behavior, we'll look at the frequency of feeding the food and the type of food, and we'll, we'll connect the dots. We'll find out that, oh, if we feed him this new, this new tomato or feed him watermelon this amount, here's the effect it will have on him and connect the dots and say, feeding him this much will yield this much gain in weight or this much gain in happiness and make those sorts of trade-offs. And so all of those number plots uh, can just be real-world pieces of data yeah, that, that, that speak to his, uh, again, there might be some outliers. There might right. be that this one day he just wasn't feeling good. Right. right. And um, it'll take that into account and cluster them appropriately. Right, so that's really cool. So I was thinking of the dots as, you know, like uh, chow, hay, watermelon, and stuff like that. And all of that is measured upon, you know, how he's reacting to that food, but that line that the machine draws, right, is is that measurement, is understanding you can follow this pattern of all of the different foods that we fed lightning and then understand, okay, I see, like you said, we feed him this, this, and this, he's gonna have this kind of experience over time. Right, and we wanna maximize and make lightning as, as happy and, and great as we can. Totally. Thank you, Chris, so much for explaining all of this stuff. I learned a lot today, especially about AI and machine learning. Yeah, this is such a wild concept. And of course, we hear a lot about it in, in kind of pop culture. You know, we hear about AIs and, you know, like the you know, kind of robot taking over the world and stuff. But, but really, the approaches are, first of all, both complex but also simpler than those concepts and, and really different and, and the applications uh, that, that we actually see in the world are, are, are really cool and really really scientific and really about a scientific approach to, to interpreting the universe and that was so cool to, to learn more about that. Thank you so much. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And make sure you, sure you all stay tuned for our live Q&A with Chris. Yeah, we're going to get to ask him all sorts of cool questions about all the stuff that we learned so I can't wait to hear your questions. Stay tuned. Thanks. All right. That was a wild journey. It was so fun to, to, to learn so much more than, I, I mean, this has been a fascinating topic to, to us for a while, but um, and particularly me, but uh, it was so cool to meet an, an expert, somebody who's kind of dedicated their life to, to um, understanding the uh, mathematics and computer science that underlie all of that. So thank you, Chris. Um, teachers, would you like to call out some of the, the questions that uh, the students or, or some of the ideas too? There, was, uh, there were a lot of just like kind of ideas popping up, not even necessarily just questions per se, but there were, there, would you like to shout out some of the things that were catching people's imagination or, or interesting ideas that were shouted out? Some of the interesting ideas is they are definitely excited about the being able to feed their pets with their robot, helping them know what's best for their, their pets. And the questions in the chat are, how do they program a robot to help them win that video game? And how long will it take them to accomplish that goal? Also, how do drones actually work? <laughs> sure, so I'll, I'll take each of those one at a time. Um, so how long does it take you to program a, a, an AI or, or, or something to play a game? It entirely depends on the game. If it's really simple, um, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, guessing a coin flip. You can just say, well, always return true, or sorry, always return heads, and maybe it'll get it right half the time, right? It's just return heads. It's not a very good AI, though. Um, if you want to write an AI to play, for example, StarCraft, or think of a really complicated game you've played, well, that might take a while. But one of the things that we're trying to do with AI and machine learning is make it so that the computer can spend all the time learning it so you don't have to program it. You know, typically the, the kind of older way of thinking about, or the traditional way of thinking about with AI is you have to think, well, if I'm in this situation, do this. If I see this obstacle, I should jump unless there's spikes above it, in which case I have to jump lightly. Um, versus with machine learning, the, the machine might uh, experiment and try to jump and oh, it, it lost, and then try again and oh, it lost this way. But over time, it will learn that the correct path is this way. And one of the, um, the challenges with it is to prevent something known as overfitting, where it learns too, it learns too specifically so it, it, it can't generalize. Let me give an example. Um, there's a board game called Go that I learned how to play when I was about 19 or 20. It's like chess, but you know, with, with little stones on it. And I was really excited. I thought it was such a cool game, very rich strategies. 
And I, uh, the person I learned it from was uh, moved away about two weeks after he taught it to me. So I, I played with all of my friends and uh, none of them were as interested as I was. But after um, about a year, I played one of my friends um, again and he completely beat me, even though I played so much more than him. And that's because I learned how to beat beginners. I never played against really good people. And so I overfit, I overtrained on, on the beginning strategies. And we have the same problems with, with AI and machine learning um, that we have to work, work for. Um, and so we try to build these generic engines, these pieces of software that can learn almost no matter what the data looks like. So how do we do this with drones? Um, well, you know, drones are typically today, uh, quadcopters or, or different variations. There's several motors that are, they're just fans that blow down and it lifts the, the machine up. But how do you change the fan speeds to make it tilt this way and then fly this way and control it? And coordinating all four of those together is very challenging for anybody who's, uh, even if you've, you've flown a drone, there's already software and sometimes machine learning that adjusts the fan speed to make it more easy to control. So the way that the, the things that we worked on in, in dive plane with flying and, and training a machine to learn to fly drones is we talked in the video about features and those are the inputs to the machine. And you might think, well, what are the features of a drone? Well, it could be a video. Every pixel, every little square is an input or we sometimes use pre-process data, whether it's LIDAR, basically sending out little rays. How far is it straight forward to the next obstacle? How far is it that way to the nearest obstacle? And get a cone of those. And those are the, the features that we, we put in as well as where it's supposed to go next. So given all of that data and the fan speeds, maybe acceleration if it falls, uh, put all that together and figure out how to spin the fans at different rates to basically move it from one location to another while avoiding all badness. That is awesome. Um, I saw a bunch of people putting in all their favorite games and it does make me wonder like, are, you know, like maybe Chris, you have some insight. Does, does, do you know if anybody does any research on games like Among Us, you know, are there player, are there, are there artificial intelligences in any of these game platforms? Or are those typically just human beings? Oh uh, yeah, um, so Among Us is a great example of a game where you know there, there's deception involved, like like who is you know is this person telling the truth? Are they not? And that is there are there are almost probably about a hundred years of research in the mathematics of something known as game theory, which is not related uh, historically to computer games. It, it came out of economics, you know, studying money, studying incentives. But it turns out that there's a big overlap between the two of them. And how do you study situations where people might not be telling the truth? It's really complicated. We have a lot of math to understand and deal with that. Um, but in terms of other games, I saw somebody uh, you know, mention Rocket League. We've actually hooked the dive plane uh, AI up to Rocket League before to have it score goals. And most, um, you know, most big games that you've played have people on board who program the AIs or, or bring the tools together and, and train them. And you'd be surprised at the amount of artificial intelligence behind the scenes sometimes in games. You know, imagine your character and you go from town to town and maybe you did something that wasn't so good in this one town. And in this game, that reputation follows you. Um, and there might be artificial intelligence built throughout the system subtly to model how people might've talked about the good or bad things that you've done. Um, so it's, it's widely used all over the place in, in games. That's awesome. Um, what, one of the two, oh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Steve. Yeah, I no, actually go ahead, have please. a question. Um, kind of related to artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence and um, games, is that when we're playing all of these games and we have like a, a, a non-player computer character, so someone that, a, a, a character that um, the person who's playing the game doesn't control and is like actually a part of the game, would you call that an artificial intelligence? Um, because some, they can react to what the player does? It can be, and this is where the line gets really blurry. Um, we as people like to uh, anthropomorphize things where we think, oh, that's a, that's a human and, or that's human-like. And it turns out um, a, a friend of mine has a, a, a great program that he showed, which is a circle. It's, it's literally it shows on the screen a circle with two little circles that move around. And they move around like eyes. So it looks, looks like the, you know, the, the, the bot is sitting there kind of looking around bored and sometimes they'll look at, intently at you as they'll focus. And all it is, is a very simple trigonomic equation that he uses to move those two circles around. But we as people think, oh, well that looks human. That like, wow, that's a real live character. And it's not, it's you know, a couple of lines of code. And 
It, it could be that simple, or it could be an entire rich, uh, massively trained AI that might even be able to talk back to you. You know, if you've used um, any of the, the voice, the, the voice bots, you know, whether Siri um, or some of the chat bots, sometimes that is many, many, many years of work and thousands of scientists putting uh, tons of data into it to create this, this little bot. So it could be anywhere in between. So cool. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more um, kind of idea um, and or question. Any thoughts from, from Ms. Williams or Ms. Jeffries? Yes, there's one that keeps coming back up, Fortnite. Everybody would like to know how this applies to the game Fortnite. Ah, well, um, so there's, there's many ways that it applies to that game. Uh, one is, you know, they, they, they don't like cheaters in a lot of first person shooter games because somebody might say, oh, well, I want to have an AI to play for me to help me aim or help me, you know, do things like that because AIs have gotten quite good at that. And if you've got an AI that can aim so much faster than you can, you can kind of win much easier or, or, or play for you. And so a lot of games, even if you're not playing with AI in the game, the game companies will use AIs to try to find people who are cheating or trying to work their way around the system. They'll also figure out and, and sometimes use AI to um, understand the way that players play to understand what people like. So for example, maybe you know, people don't use some character very often or, or don't use some weapon or some technique and they, the de designers think, well, why, why don't they? This is kind of fun. And maybe it turns out that they just need to fix something that there's a problem in the, uh, in the game mechanics and how they designed it. And so AI can be used to, to help address and find those things. Um, and uh, you know, also to, to find bad behavior. If you've got that one player who is just, man, saying a lot of really not nice things, um, AI can be used to detect those and you know, sort of help under help make the community better. That is so cool. I I, I really like you highlighting the way that 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 these are often tools for developers or creators of the things that we enjoy that we sometimes often associate with AI. That that AI is is not really like. Um, you know, task dependent, we can kind of apply them to all the things that you would apply your own mind to, you know, um, so cool. Um, oh, yeah, one, one note on that is, is uh, you know, everybody who's watching this, if you've used the internet or you use a device connected to the internet today, odds are some of the way that you've interacted or some of the data that's been transmitted has been affected by or looked at by an AI. It's, it's very pervasive behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And and so so dive plane, your your company, they um, it seems like y'all do a lot of this uh, helping other groups kind of either analyze data or or make. Um, uh, I think you mentioned you also do kind of um, helping databases and data analytics systems maintain privacy and things like that. Um, and, and so these these are things that you might not like immediately associate with with artificial intelligence but they're really powerful because you can you can do them quickly or you can do them very powerfully or very accurately or um or very precisely and uh and i was wondering if you would like to share just a little bit about um specifically some of the things that the dive plane does behind the scenes yeah there's there's a lot of ai and machine learning tools out there and some of them uh, they make decisions and you don't know why they made the decision they're very accurate but is there some problem that is there some some systemic problem that you want to fix or, or you know, what if something changes and you might not know how to do that? Well, the techniques that we're working on and that, that, that uh, my company works on are ones that are very understandable. So you can fix those types of problems. The other thing that we work on is privacy. You know, let's say that, you know, lightning had a, you know, you, fed, you tried feeding lightning a tomato and maybe that wasn't the best food for, for lightning and he had a bad stomach day, right? And so you wanna learn that, uh, you know, lightning shouldn't have tomatoes, or let's say that, you know, certain animals shouldn't have tomatoes, but maybe lightning is a little embarrassed to tell everyone that he had a bad stomach day that day. And so privacy, uh, you know, with artificial intelligence is extremely important because uh, AI and machine learning can really, you know, pinpoint and affect your behavior, sometimes in positive or negative ways, or, you know, pr present things to you that wouldn't be in your best interest. Um, but are in someone else's best interest. But making sure that there's good privacy there, make sure that, that, that your interests are aligned, that, you know, that your embarrassing things aren't uncovered, but also that people don't take advantage of you as much. That is so cool. 
Um, I uh, I just wanted to call out Miss Williams. I, I thought it was really cool that you 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 mentioned that uh, you really like how well the math and science concepts play into all of this. And I rem I, I noticed several people um, were were interested in in kind of what it took for you to to kind of enter this field and how and how often you use mathematics and, and kind of computational and or um, problem solving ideas. And I think I think you said every day, basically, which which totally makes sense. This is your job. But um, but yeah, it, um, I, I know we're, we're about at time. So uh, but I, could you briefly just tell us like, yeah, how did how do, how do people prepare for a, for a, a life in computer science uh, and, and, you know, working with tools like this? Yeah, it's a really exciting time for AI and machine learning. And it's, it's both uh, anything is kind of the answer. If you can, you know, start, you know, download a few, few tools, play around, learn how to program, then you can pull down machine learning frameworks and, and these, these tools that give you a ton of power at your fingertips. Steve, you're just showing me before that you just downloaded a few things, you know, clicked a few buttons and had, had some code and you could have a Mario that didn't play very well, but all the tools there are very easy to use and easy to get started. So uh, all you need to do is, is learn how to program a little bit to, to get started there. Uh, on the uh, converse, you know, for myself, I work in some of the core algorithms. Now, algorithms are how these machine algorithms, these machine learning or AI techniques work, and I'm trying to advance the state of the art. So for me, I went through, uh, you know, uh, undergraduate college um, in computer science, math, and computer engineering. Um, I have my PhD in computer science, so I spent another six years after undergrad studying the mathematics behind it, um, taking all sorts of advanced math, including uh, game theory, information theory category theory, statistics, um, and in many operations research, many related fields. And just like you have a, you know, you learn arithmetic in the early years, and then you get a calculator that does that for you. And maybe in high school, you know, you learn more advanced techniques with algebra and maybe calculus. And now you get a graphing calculator that can plot it. Well, AI and machine learning are the next step or, or one of the next steps up. You know, we as, uh, uh, researchers have many tools that are at those levels above those graphing calculators. And that's what we leverage to solve some of our problems and, and advance the state of the art. So, you know, in my situation, I use math every day, but not every machine learning practitioner needs it every day. They might just need it sometimes to validate to make sure they get the results. So it depends on, on you know, kind of where you want to go in the field. So cool. Thank you, Chris. My pleasure. I just, as we're wrapping up, I just want to thank all of our uh, learners in the chat for being so engaged. And um, I just want to say that, you know, um, we were talking about how there's so much math and science in making, not only making games, but playing games. And I'm th I think everyone here really learned a lot about how it is tech technology isn't just you know, one type of thing. It, it can, it involves so many things that we actually love doing. And I think that's just really wonderful. And I'm so glad that we got to have this conversation today. Um, and so I want to thank all of our friends who are in the chat. I want to thank um, George Watts Montessori and Spring Valley. Thank you so, so much to Miss Williams and Miss Jeffries for uh, joining us today. And thank you so much, Dr. Chris at Di and everyone at Dive Plane. Um, for uh, making this video possible today. Also, thank you for uh, Willow Austin Soha and Dr. Linda Tregurian, our Durham Public Schools partners. Thank you for making this uh, whole video series possible um, this year. Steve, where are we going next week? Yeah, so um, I, again, yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, so we are going to be heading to UNC to meet some researchers that look at um, disease ecology in plants. And so um, just like humans, just like us, um, plants can get sick with fungal infections. And so these researchers are really interested in understanding how these fungal infections affect plants, particularly grasses. And just as we learned in our um, cheese making episode and in our cattle ranch, ranching episode, um, raising healthy pastures is a really important part of keeping um, healthy herds and healthy land. And so we're going to connect with some, some scientists from UNC that do the kind of legwork in better understanding how to keep those grasses healthy and just generally understanding how the relationship between grass and fungus happens in nature. And so they're ecologists. They study systems of a biological and abiotic or non-living and living systems. Yeah, exactly. In the chat, someone said, yay, fungus. And fungus is a lot, 
really fun to learn about. It's a lot more than we just than we think about it. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone, and I hope to see you soon next week. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.